Good morning, church. <laughs> you know, it's, um, it's funny when you begin to uh, prepare, especially if you're preparing a message or a sermon for the body of Christ, and then you stop and you consider that you don't, we don't live in a vacuum. You know, we don't live in a bubble, so to speak. But even as we are teaching these principles and trying to live them ourselves, life is happening. And for a lot of God's people, life is hard. Life's hard. We're going through different trials and different situations. Circumstances sometimes of our own making and other times uh, the creation of other people. But the word of God is real. And I want to encourage whomever you are and wherever you're going through to know that the word of God is real. And uh, God is, is worth trusting. I know when I've gone through my dark periods and all the conciliatory words, um, they come and, and sometimes they are all the more painful for their being true because we know that God is good and we know that God is real and he's all powerful. And so when things don't go well for us, then we have a tendency to think then why is God allowing this to happen? And so I want to encourage you in the words of the old song, hold to his hand, to God's unchanging hand. This world around you is transitioning, it's slipping, it's sliding, it's falling, it's breaking apart. Evil men with power and position do evil things to hurt other people on the grand scale and on the small scale. But in the midst of all this, through every sunrise and every sunset, understand that God is still God and he's still on the throne. And when it's all said and done, church, when it's all over, you know, that's what we have to play for. We have to play for the end game. Because if you get your eyes off of him midstream, the circumstances can become overwhelming. So I want to encourage whomever that is, whosoever's heart is feeling overwhelmed this morning, I want to encourage you to hold to God's unchanging hand. So let me transition from one microphone to the other. We can start our teaching for today. All right. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God is good. I just feel a, necess <clears throat> a necessity of saying that this morning, that God is good. Uh, well, let's open the word. So uh, as way of introduction, let me give you an insight to my thoughts this morning. Back in October of 1859, a man named John Brown and 18 to 21 of his associates, depending on which resource you read, uh, decided to attack the United States Arsenal in Harpers Ferry, Virginia. He had no rations, he had no long-term support set up, he had no plan of escape. Uh, the Daring Act came to be known as John Brown's raid. But what others saw as being a, an, an act, a single act, perhaps of a desperate man, came to be known by many as the seed of what would otherwise be called the American Civil War. But like so many contemporaries of John Brown who saw his actions uh, as being ill-conceived, we as Christians, contemporarily speaking, sometimes we, 
we see the act of repentance in that same way. A lot of the abolitionists, the fellow abolitionists of John Brown's time looked at what he did and said, uh, it's, uh, it's a single event. It has no real chance of making a long-term difference. And so they would not support it. They did not get behind it. And so many times, I think we as Christians, we see the act of repentance in the same way. We see it as a single event. And whereas we value the act of repentance, we don't really attach it sometimes to the overarching scheme of our lives. And so like John Brown, we go into an event, we don't have a long-term plan and there's no escape route and those around us who are watching us and don't really give us much chance for success overall. But what I'd like to do this morning is just take a moment to talk to you about repentance, not as an act, but as a lifestyle. Not as an act, but as a lifestyle. Not in simply coming before the Lord and saying, God, uh, forgive me for violating X, Y, or Z. But rather looking at repentance as a way of saying, Lord, I love you. As a way of saying, Lord, I want my life to reflect who you are. I want to be in perfect communion with you. So instead of communion as the single act, I want us to think about communion as the act of love. So with that, let's pray. Father, again, I thank you as I come before you and I stand before your people. I know, Lord God, that there's life in your word. And Father, when we uh, come before you and, and we compare ourselves to you, there are so many deficiencies. And so many times, Lord God, the, the, the comparison seems overwhelming and we can be tempted to push back, to stand down. But Lord, I'm asking you this morning that you would encourage our hearts, that we can see behind the veil and know what it was your plan for us and given us this gift of repentance. And we thank you and we praise you for that now in Jesus' name. As you open your Bibles to the, our first scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 11, I want us to consider the fact that Paul in this passage, while not setting out to give a, a, a dissertation perhaps on repentance, but due to the circumstances of the event, did just that. He outlaid for us that there are two different types of repentance. He pointed out that these two types of repentances are born from two different mindsets, two different states of heart, two different types of character. One of the types of repentance that he refers to here, and we'll see in a moment, is a type of repentance that causes me to find peace and ease within myself due to the circumstance of the situation that I find myself in. That type of repentance is self-serving. I want to feel better. I want to correct my problem for where I am right now. But there is a greater aspect of repentance that Paul draws our attention to, and he says that it's the type of repentance that draws us to life. Now, if we look at just some quick comparisons from Scripture, we think of people like King Saul in the Old Testament. When he repented before the prophet, it did not change his character. It did not result in a change of his behavior, and ultimately, his lifestyle led to his death. We see the same thing is true of Judas. When Judas repented in the, Old, in the New Testament, he felt bad about betraying the Lord, even going so far as taking the money back to the priests and giving it to them and throwing it into the temple. He abandoned the money. He felt bad. He said, you guys have abandoned or, or, or betrayed innocent blood. But his type of repentance did not change the character of the man. And then we look again into the Old Testament, we look at King David when he was caught in sin and, and confronted in righteousness, he repented, but that repentance resulted in a change of lifestyle. His character was fundamentally changed. And then we see again with Peter, when Peter was confronted with his uh, denial of the Lord, we see in him his brokenness, and then out of that came a complete change of character. He was no longer like the Peter before, 
he became something new. So when we read this, I want us to keep that in mind, and I want us to think about not just the event, but the lifestyle. Uh, by now, I hope everyone has found 2 Corinthians. Let's start reading, please, in chapter 7, starting at verse 8. Paul begins, even if the letter I wrote you made you sad, I am not sorry I wrote it. I know that the letter made you sad, and I was sorry for that, but it made you sad only for a short time. Now I am happy, not because you were made sad, but because your sorrow made you repent, made you decide to change. That is what God wanted. So you were not hurt by us in any way. The kind of repentance, sorrow, that God wants makes people decide to repent and change their lives. This leads them to salvation, and we cannot be sorry for that. But the kind of repentance that the world has will bring death. You have the kind of repentance God wanted you to have. Now see what that repentance has brought you. It has made you very serious. It made you want to prove that you were not wrong. It made you angry at your sin and afraid of displeasing God. It made you want to see me. It made you care. It made you want the right thing to be done. You proved that you were not guilty and had any part in that problem. So now as we begin to think about this act of repentance, or these two sides of repentance, and as I'm asking you to do this morning, to extrapolate this out over the, the span of your life and not just an event, let's give it a context. When Jesus was describing in one way the purpose of his ministry, when he was trying to tell us what it was that he had come to do in fulfilling the law, he described that to us in the gospel as recorded by Matthew in chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. Let me read that to you. And Jesus said in answer to a question, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Loving God, truly loving God, is the essence of our relationship with the Lord. So when we think about repentance as a lifestyle, what I'm trying to convey to you this morning is this is an act of you loving God. Let me share a quote with you from a book I've been reading the, uh, by A.W. Tozer, The Attributes of God. Here he highlights one of the attributes he discovered in the person of Christ, and he's talking about holiness. And he's talking about holiness as it compares to us, the believers. He reads, uh, it reads, I'll start over uh, page 46, he said, 146, I'm sorry. He said, let not some of the qualities of Jesus, let's note some of the qualities of Jesus. The first one, of course, is holiness. Our God is holy and our Lord is holy, and we call the Spirit the Holy Spirit. Now think how stained and how spotted and how carnal the average Christian is. We allow stains. Months go by without repentance. Years go by without asking for cleansing or taking it. Then we sing, draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord. Or we pray, come Lord, come to this meeting. Well, the Lord is there. What we're praying is, O oh Lord, show thyself. But the Lord cannot. A holy God cannot show himself in full communion to an unholy Christian. You ask, is it possible to be a Christian and be unholy? It's possible to be a carnal Christian. You can have the seed of God in you, be regenerated and justified, and still be unholy in some of your inner feelings and desires and willingness. So this morning, what I want to try to convey to you is that thought, that when we're talking about repentance, what we're really talking about is, am I living my life in such a way that I have the best communion with God that I possibly can? Or am I entertaining thoughts, ideas, or state of being that keeps me separated from God and allows me to continue in my life without pressing into knowing him better? And the answer to that question for each one of us is yes. But that's not the problem. The problem is not discovering that we have a sin issue. The problem comes in when we ask ourselves, 
What are we willing to do about it? What are we willing to do about it? When the scripture makes statements like it does here in 1 Peter, in chapter 1, verse 16, he says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And then again in Leviticus eleven forty four, it is recorded, For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Two questions for you this morning, church. First question. When you hear those passages and passages like those, what do you think it is the Lord is saying? When he says, be holy for I am holy, what it is you think he is saying? And the second part of that question becomes, what do you think he intends of you by making that statement? When he says you be holy for I am holy, what do you think he is really saying to you? And then what do you think he intends you to do with that question, with that response? What do, he, what do you think he's expecting of your life? Some of us would hear him say, well, when you make a mistake or when you mess up, come back to me and, and be cleansed, be healed, be made whole. And yes, there is some of that in there. He is calling us back to himself. But what I hear the Spirit saying is this, come, love me. Come, live in such a way that we may have uninterrupted communion. Come, live in such a way that every day for you will be like it was when I walked in the cool of the day with Adam in the garden. Now I wanna challenge your worldview. Do you believe that's possible? Do you believe it's possible for people like you and me to walk in communion with God like Adam did in the cool of the day? Now, the reason I ask you this, church, because it goes back to this point of repentance. The reason I ask you this is because if you do not believe it's even possible, you will never aspire to reach it. If you don't think it's possible for you to have that level of communion and level of relationship with God, then you will not press through to achieve it. Because every time you are faced with an obstacle in your flesh or an obstacle in culture, you will accept that as being the rule of the day. And you will give in to it and not press through it. So I ask you, do you believe it's possible? Long as we got our finger in 2 Corinthians, turn with me to the 11th chapter. This one's not in your notes, but I thought I would add it because I want to show the justification of what I'm saying. It's so important, church, that we understand that there is nothing in God's word that is, one, not possible for us, and two, not intended for us. So when I'm talking to you about walking in this level of repentance where the emotion of your life is to say, God, I, I love you more. God, I want you more. I want you to understand that people just like you and I have already achieved this. Let me share a, a thumbnail sketch from the life of Paul, a man just like you and I, starting in the 23rd verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, saved one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among the false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watching often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. 
Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak? Am I not weak? Who is offended? And I not, and I burn not. If I must need glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. The God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. Now I read that to you because I want you to understand that Paul was a man just like you and I. And probably suffered a lot more things than you and I have in our, in our life. But nonetheless, he held true to this. He held true to this idea of repentance. This idea of wanting to be close to God. This idea that my life only matters as it is reflected in the light of who God is. That no matter what situation I face, no matter what circumstance I face, whether I was in the city and people were trying to kill me, whether I was in a country and people were trying to kill me, whether it was animals trying to kill me or my fellow Jews trying to kill me, whether I got shipwrecked and was floating in the water for three days and not knowing what was beneath me and what was going to bite my toes or any of those other kind of things, no matter what circumstance I found myself, hungry, cold, tired, beat up, stone, whipped, beat, Paul said, I did not change. He did not allow the circumstances that he found himself in to determine who or what the course of his life would be. He had a statement in his life of repentance. I asked you earlier, What did you hear when you hear those passages of scripture when God says, be holy for I am holy? Be perfect for I am perfect. What do you hear? I hear the Spirit saying, come. Come to me. Come to me and let me love you. And come and you love me. I hear him saying that I want to walk with you the same way I walked with Adam in the garden. I hear him saying, and this is perhaps a greater challenge. I hear him saying, I want to walk with you the same way I walked with Jesus when he was on the earth. Open your Bibles to John 17. I want to read a short passage of the prayer that Jesus prayed to his father before his arrest. Starting in verse 14, Jesus is praying. He's talking to the Father. He says, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Before we go any further, have you heard the qualifiers that Jesus used in his prayers? Let's look at that again. Starting off, he says, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world. First qualifier, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest taken them out of the world, but that thou should keepest them from evil. They are not of the world. Second qualifier, even as I am not of the world. See how Jesus is drawing you into comparisons or to rather into connection with himself. Then he goes on in verse 17. He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And finally, he says, as thou sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Now to appreciate this, we must ask ourselves the question, how was the father with Jesus when Jesus was in the world? What was the state of their connectedness? What was the state of their relationship when Jesus walked the face of this earth? And then we must understand that this is what God wants for you and for me.
But to have that type of intimacy with God happens because we determine that it will be our reality. Having that kind of intimacy with God comes from having what I like to call purposed closeness. Purposed closeness. That's when you and I make the conscious decision to build a lifestyle that makes communion with God possible. That's where having a repentant lifestyle comes in. We often talk about the idea or the concept of holiness, but that first step toward holiness is repentance. And in order for you to walk in holiness, you have to first walk in a mindset of repentantness. And when we say repenting, this is what we mean. This is what the Bible means by repentance. They tell us in school not to do negative teaching, so I'm going to violate a rule. I'm going to do some negative teaching. I'm going to tell you what repentance is not. Repentance is not feeling bad. Repentance is not crying. Repentance is not just feeling sorry. This is what repentance is. Repentance is when I change my mind and agree with God. And as a result of changing my mind and agreeing with God, then my behavior changes. You see, I can stop hitting you and still hate you. I can change my behavior without ever changing my mind. I can stop cheating on my wife and still commit adultery in my heart if I don't change my mind. I may never take that watch off the desk, but still be a thief in my heart if I don't change my mind. I have to agree with God that what God has said about any given situation is correct and true. And then once I agree with God that what he has said is correct and true, if I have truly agreed with him, then my behavior reflects what I think inside. So repentance doesn't guarantee that you won't get caught in the rainstorms of life. But what repentance will do is keeping you from getting soaked through. Because repentance will stop you and make you turn around because I have now said, God, I believe what you're saying is true. There's a passage. Are, we, are you still with me, church? Because I know when we talk about things like this, they have a tendency to, to come across as being heavy. And that's not the intent that I have, and it's not the intent of the word. Pastor, over the last few weeks, has been talking about mercy and grace. Just wonderful gifts that God has provided for us. He talked last time about existing under the mercy. We, we, he, he was bringing, he made an illustration once a couple of weeks ago and he talked about being under the shadow of God's wings on the mercy seat. Under the mercy seat, the wings come across and, and the law was held beneath that. You had to remove the mercy of God to get to the law. He's used this illustration a few times. And so as we were thinking about how do I access the grace of God. I have to abide in that place of grace and mercy. But I can't do that if I'm walking around contrary to the will of God. 
And notice, I'm not talking about guys just, oops, I stepped in the cow pile, let me clean my shoe. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about avoiding the idea of the incidental repentances and living with a lifestyle dedicated to repentance. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 20, it tells us that God has made for us a new and living way. This way is opened up to us through the flesh of Jesus Christ. This way is open. All we have to do is access it. I talked to you a minute ago about Paul. You know, we think about this lifestyle of repentance. Think about the heroes of the faith. Noah walked in this lifestyle of repentance. Moses and Abraham walked in this lifestyle of repentance. David walked in this lifestyle of repentance. Peter and John walked in this lifestyle of repentance. The question is, will you? We talked Friday night about this concept of faith. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2, it gives us a very telling glimpse into the heart of man and also into the heart of God. If you'll turn there quickly, it's just a short passage, but I want to read it to you and I want you to see it. It says simply, but the word preached, talking to the nation of Israel in the desert, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Wednesday night at Bible study, a pastor was talking about the seed, the parable of the seed and the sower. And as he was talking, I was thinking about my notes and how what he said related to the truth of this word. That the sower went out to sow and the seed fell on various types of ground. And in some places, the seed grew and produced fruit. In other places, it just died. I make me correct myself. In one place, the seed grew and produced fruit. In all the other places, the seed died. But Pastor pointed out on Wednesday night, there was nothing wrong with the seed. What was wrong was the condition of the soil or of the heart in which the seed was sown. And we see this reflected here in Hebrews where it says that faith did not mix with the word so it did not profit them. So we began to talk about this in our study on Friday that we, we said faith is empowered or faith works by love. Faith gets its power from love. So when you and I see the word of God, we see the principles of God in front of us, and we see this, this vast array of ugliness that we call life that we have to go through from day to day, and we see that existence, and God's word is standing up in front of us as a guide. Now we have to decide whether or not we will employ faith to see that word come alive in our lives. But the Bible tells us clearly that faith works by love. And that would be good enough except for the Spirit of God went even further and described to us in the Gospel of John what Jesus says, if you love me, you will what? Keep my commandments. So let's th apply this back to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2. Those who failed in the desert, failed in the desert because they did not love God. They did not love God, so therefore faith did not work. They saw the word of God, they saw the miracles of God, but because they had no love for God, they could not bring themselves into obeying God. And when they did not obey God, they died. So how does that apply to us today, Pastor? We will fail just as surely as they did if we fail to love God.
Hear what the Spirit is saying. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. But keeping the commandments of God has never been an issue of willpower. It has always been about loving God. Remember we said in the beginning when Jesus described his ministry, what did he say? He says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. He didn't say you must keep the Ten Commandments. He didn't say you must fast four times a month. He didn't say you got to cut your hair and do all these things that we like to do as we describe holiness. What he said was, you have to love me. He didn't even say you got to love your brother and your sister. He said, love me and then love your brother and your sister. Because it all begins with our loving God. I don't think I have to explain in great detail to you guys that the world around you is going to hell in a handbasket. It's a messed up situation. And it's in the midst of this that God has called us to live. I said earlier that God is calling you to have communion with him in the same way that he had communion with Adam. So let's look at the difference. In Adam's world, Adam woke up in the morning. There was no sickness or disease or age or death. He probably didn't even have bad breath. Didn't worry about anybody breaking in at night and trying to kill him or rob from him. He just got up and did what God told him to do and then had to look forward to the knowing at the end of the day he's going to walk with God in his presence. Now, some of us might be thinking in our mind, but yeah, we don't live in the Garden of Eden. We don't even live in a garden. More like a trash heap. Let's look at the world that Jesus was born into. In the world that Jesus lived and walked in, people did break in. They did rob. They did steal. They did kill. You had to wake up every morning and go to work. You had to do your 8, 10, 12, 14 hours a day of work. They didn't have Social Security. They didn't have pensions. They just went to work. And they had to deal with sickness and disease. They had to deal with growing old and the ravishes of age. And they had to deal with death. This was the world that Jesus walked in. And this is the world that God has said to you and I, as I sent my son, so send I you. This is the world that God has said, as I was with my son, I will be with you. So the question to you and I becomes, what will we do to achieve that level of communion? Let's look at one last set of scriptures. Turn your Bibles, please, to 1 John. We're going to read those 10 verses of chapter 1, and then we'll be just about done. John opens his letter by saying, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifest and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard and declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 
If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, I have often heard this said and I've used the phrase myself that first John is the Christian's bar of soap. When you fall or you sin, just go grab 1 John, especially verse 9, scrub up, confess, and God will forgive and restore you. Go back to business. But what I would like to do is challenge that mindset. Rather than thinking about it as being the bar of soap, which is necessary and, and, and good, and of all the examples I gave you earlier today, the great men of God, each one of them had their time with the bar of soap. But what I would like to challenge you with this morning is this. Rather than thinking of it as being the bar of soap to clean up after the fact. Let's think of it again, as I said earlier, as rain guard. Let's spray it on and keep clean. Rather than anticipating the stumble and the fall into the mud puddles of life. Let's spray it on and let's anticipate walking in the light as he is in the light. Now, again, it comes down to your worldview or your presupposition. Do you believe this is possible? If you do not think it is possible, then you will never, ever achieve it. Your strivings will be false. It reminds me of when I was teaching martial arts, and this has no real value in life, but we do it sometimes to build confidence in our students. We'll give them a drill, something like breaking a board. And you'll demonstrate, there's this one drill where we do where we have three boards set up, and it's a speed punch drill. It's a right cross, a left cross, and a follow through, right? Boom, three quick break, pow, 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 pow. Okay, here is the problem. If you're not full of conviction when you hit those boards, all you get is a nice loud thunk and a bruise on your knuckles. But if you have conviction when you swing, solid fist, fast and follow through, you get a nice crisp snap. The board flies in half and you look really cool on tape. But the difference is the amount of conviction. See, and this is how so many of us approach this idea of holiness and repentance. We go through the motions, but we don't really believe that we can do it in the first place. So when the board doesn't break, we're like, oh, that's where it is. We go through life expecting to act like non-believers. We go through life expecting to fail, to have moral failure. We expect to lose our temper. We expect to blow up. We expect to fall apart. We expect to feel hopeless. We expect this feeling of defeatedness to cover our lives. And so when it happens, we accept that as being par for the course. I'm not saying you won't experience those things. God will bring the trials into your life that he sees fit. But the difference is, when you stand up to face those boards, do you swing with conviction and power, or do you swing just going through the motions? Do we have that mindset of repentance? I want to agree with you, God. Truly agree with you on the aspects of life. I want to leave you with one verse. And then we're going to close. We're going to pray. And that's found, and my wife likes to say, you can't say First Jude, uh, Jude, we can't say Jude chapter 1 because there's only one chapter. But that's just the way my mind works. So Jude chapter 1, verse 24. Jude's writing, he says, Now unto him. Now it's important that we understand who him is. Him is not the government. Him is not the church. Him is not Pastor Mike. Him is God. 
Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence for the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Look at that first part of that phrase, verse 24. Now unto him who is able, who is able to keep you from falling, who is able to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. One of the things that we as Christians are really good at doing is deferment. We look at a passage like that and we say, oh yeah, he's able once I get to heaven. Oh, he's able to keep me faultless in heaven. When I get to heaven, I'll be faultless and I'll, oh yeah, I'll stand. Oh man, in that day, in that great by and by. How many of you guys know you need it now? You need it now. All around you, this world is sinking into darkness. You need it now. And as believers, guys, we are not immune to that darkness. We need to be kept now. So we just read the word of God. We know he's able. He's not a man that he should lie. We know he's able to keep us, to deliver us. The question we have to ask ourselves is simply this. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? I remember the first time I did that speed drill. I get up on the boards and I stand there and I'm looking at those boards. I'm thinking, okay, I can do this. I can do this. And it's whack, whack, whack. <sighs> Two out of three, that's not bad, that's not bad. And then you go begin, it's whack, whack, whack. And it's zero out of three, because the pain makes you have less conviction. <laughs> the more it hurts, the less convicted you get. You start. And so I remember I was doing a show for one of the schools. All these kids, like 1,200 kids out there, and we're doing this demo for them one day. And I'm up to do this speed break, and I'm thinking to myself, I ain't going down in front of these kids. Because they will tell you the truth about yourself. Kids are not like adults, they don't do political correctness. So I'm thinking to myself, I better get my game on. So I stood out there, my partner said, you ready? I said, you ready, you ready? It's like, okay, let's do this thing. Whack, 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 whack. Boom, I'm like, yes, got all three of them looking good. Videotape looked excellent. I got a copy at home, I'll show it to you sometime. <laughs> and I'm thinking, that was cool. But I remember when I did that, because I went through it the way I was trained to go through it, hit it with conviction, speed and power, I didn't even feel it. Didn't even feel it. Now when I hit it soft and I played games, that's when I got bloody knuckles. That's when my ring gouged my finger because I didn't hit right. But when you did it right, it just worked. So I'm here to tell you, the word of God works. There's no games involved. We fail when we don't apply faith to the word. Faith works by love. Jesus says, love the Father with all your heart all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, all your imagination, all your money, all your time, all your energy. Love God with everything you have. And then walking in the light becomes easy. Because you're in love with him. Not because you're trying to keep the rules. So with that, let's pray. Gracious Father, we just thank you now in the name of Jesus for your goodness and for your kindness. Lord, if your word was so, so simple or so low that, that we could do it without a challenge, and then I ask what would be the purpose of the cross? If we could save ourselves, we would not have needed the deliverance of the Lamb. 
But just like the word tells us, you knew that we would need a savior even before we were created. And so the standard of your word is high and it's, it's lofty, but you are a high and lofty God. And no time do you ever stand above us and tell us to come up, but instead you came down to where we are and your word tells us you gently lead those. And sometimes you carry the lambs in your bosom. And so at no time, Lord, do we ever have to worry about you abandoning us because you are a faithful and you are a good God. You are indeed the good shepherd. So as we come before you this morning, we're asking you, Lord, to uh, help us to adopt within ourselves a, a commitment to, to focus and purposed closeness with you. Help us to want to be close to you more than we want anything else. Help us to see and filter the world situations around us through the, the lens of your word and through your truth. Jesus, you said in your prayer that you have given us the Father's word and his word is truth. And so, Lord, help us to see the world around us through that lens of truth. And you told us in your word, Lord, that we were not to do this of our own accord. But we are to wait on you until we receive power. And I pray, Father, that you would fill us again with your Holy Spirit. First, Lord God, to come into a fullness and awareness of this idea of a lifestyle of repentance and to move us into holiness where we're walking in communion with you. And then, Lord, to be the effective witnesses that you've called us to be. But help us, Lord, not to sit back waiting, but help us to engage you actively that you might be fulfilled in us, your purposes realized in us. We thank and we praise you again for the cross of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the cleansing blood of the Lamb. We thank you for the resurrection which gives us hope of our own resurrection. And we thank you for the word that we can turn to any time of day or night and find to be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We give you the glory now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As always, we invite you to meet us here at the altar for prayer. If you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then I would challenge you that none of this is going to do you any good until you take that first step of repentance. Where you say, God, I'm sorry for being a sinner. Forgive me. Cleanse me and make me your own. And if you are there and you want us to pray with you, we'll be glad to do that. And if you are a believer and you've been stumbling back and you're saying, Lord, it's time for me to take that step, then we'll be glad to agree with you in prayer as well. And so, church, we dismiss you now to enter in time of worship and praise. And if you have a need for prayer, meet us here at the altar, we pray. in Jesus' name.